Well, coming there, did you look at Phil Harrington, who's been convening this seminar series for the Fabians this, uh, this year. Um, we've been in various rooms around the ground floor of the university, and I'm pleased to see some of you have uh, found case room one, which is sort of said, get something more conspicuous in the middle of the foyer there, but we tucked away at the end of the same thing. Uh, for what is the first of two uh, seminars, I, I've known Robert for a while. He, he's been active um, in the uh, er, area of social responsibility and also uh, in environmental politics. Uh, and I think it's quite um, valuable for the Fabians to hear those two ideas put together. It, it's been a tradition of ours to, to have heard these ideas put together in various ways. You may remember that um, uh, Rick Bowman, uh, when he was at the Institute of, of um, New Zealand Institute, was it before it became whatever it is now, with the, the with the link up with the um, the round table, uh, he spoke about the, uh, the the relate the arrangement between the capacity of an economy to survive and the capacity of of uh, the environment to survive alongside it, and how the two things um, will at some point and have at various points intersected to a point where you can't have one without the other. Uh, making the point that we've had oil shocks and we've had um, moments of industrial growth which have produced significant risk for both the economy, the economy and for the environment. And we still haven't seen all of the signposts, we haven't read all of them all of the messages uh, and we still haven't found an appropriate policy uh, framework for managing that. And it's with that in mind that I appreciated the offer Robert made uh, to come back from his time recently in Australia uh, to talk to us. He's going to give us two uh, addresses. The tonight is, is the forerunner of the second one on the 19th. We will talk more about um, the sort of resolution of some of these issues today. Uh, we're going to talk about the foundations. So, Robert, thank you very much for coming. I appreciate uh, what you're doing. Of course, uh, we hope to get a copy of this up on the website on June 1st. Welcome. Well, thank you very much. An economy for a resilient world, the foundations. This is the first of two presentations. The first discusses the basic issues for a resilient economy and the choices of scientific and ethical principles. The second presentation applies the principles in considering standards and policies for our economic, financial and banking systems. And that will be in a fortnight's time. I want to take you through the diagram. You've all got one. It will, uh, I've called it ethical, economic and scientific traditions or streams. It will show that some modern philosophers, ecologists, religious thinkers have extended the Aristotelian, utilitarian, social contract and religious traditions from human, human to human earth relationships. It will show the links between the international dominant economic model and the outdated version, versions of utilitarianism and the social contract and the pre-thermodynamic principles uh, of science. So here's the uh, what I call my wiring diagram. Uh, top left is Aristotle and going across uh, the top to people like Hearst House who have dealt uh, with a, a more modern, up-to-date version of the Aristotelian tradition. Uh, you've got the social contract uh, that goes through from Hobbes uh, right through to people like Brown and Shue, the utilitarian, uh, religious, uh, neoclassic economics, and what I've called under 7b, the ecological, ecological ecologicalists, uh, ethical philosophers. These are primarily scientists who have become aware of the uh, ethical issues and have, uh, and have started to talk about the need to look at the ethical issues that the traditional uh, streams have not. Uh, 
under eight we've got the science and then uh, right at the bottom ecological economics um, and I'll talk about that in just a moment. My main conclusions are that the dominant global economic system in investment is not based on modern science. It is not based on an ethic that deals with human-earth relationships except in instrumental and anthropocentric terms. We need to place an intrinsic value on nature and develop an ethic of respect. We need to recognise that in the economy of nature the currency is solar energy that provides the means of life and we need to live within that capacity. A sustainable and resilient economy develops budgets and investment for human activity based on these scientific and ethical principles. Virtue ethics, it really started with Aristotle. He asked the question, what should I be? He talked about excellence or virtue, uh, pronesis, practical wisdom, and the concept of eudaimonia, sometimes translated as happiness, but I prefer the term flourishing. So he asked the question, what kind of person should I be to be able to have a flourishing life? And he talked about that in terms of virtues, courage, temperance, generosity, magnanimity, gentleness, friendliness, honesty. Rosalind Hursthaus, who's the professor of uh, philosophy here at this university, states that the vices of self-indulgence and short-sightedness apply to human destruction of the environment as one way of responding to a fairly radical change in the way humans engage with nature. So she's saying that in some senses you can take the traditional human-human issues that lie in the Aristotelian tradition and extend them. But she also went on to say a second way is to develop a new virtue of respect for nature. John Stuart Mill and Jeremy Bentham are the, one, the two names that one would normally associate with utilitarianism. And that is where an action is right when its outcome produces maximum utility or happiness and the minimum amount of pain for humans and animals. Uh, the whole notion of Aristotelianism was really important in its time because it extended the moral domain from just humans to include animals. And uh, as a result of that, um, they were really concerned, modern utilitarians are re have been concerned about, about the state of uh, the way in which animals are looked after. But its use in, uh, in modern terms, in terms of cost-benefit analyses, disadvantage poor people future generations in the environment. Jeremy Bentham at the bottom right would most probably, they, both Mill and, and Bentham were reformers, social reformers in their day, uh, and they would have been pretty concerned about the way in which uh, cost-benefit analyses and others have been treated. You can't say that Bentham would turn over in his grave because he was never buried. In fact, his body was preserved and put in that wooden receptacle and it's currently with the University of London and at very important serious occasions it's brought out and put in the corner of the hall where he's recorded as being present but a non-voting member. <laughs> Pete Singer, um, I put Pete Singer, uh, if you go down to 4C, if you go down to 4C you'll, and run across there, you'll see Singer uh, at the, on the right-hand side. But if you go down to, to line 7B, you'll see in the middle of there that Singer uh, with Reagan has, um, has been involved in animal rights. Uh, Singer's first, first book was about animal liberations, uh, animal liberation, and so I've, the dotted lines I've, I've linked with them. And in, in other instances, the dotted lines are, are links of people who have influenced others. Singer calls himself a consequentialist, though he really lies in the utilitarian tradition. In his 
third edition of his book Practical Ethics, he talks about the need to do no harm and he argues from that basis on the need to work to minimise climate change. He talks about the need to uh, look after us existing and future sentient creatures, to have an aesthetic appreciation of wild and unspoilt nature, to avoid large families, uh, to uh, move away from a materialistic society, to promote frugality and reuse and no extravagance. So he's against motorsports and beef and long journeys and consumption. Hobbes and Locke. Uh, Hobbes was writing in the middle of the 17th century, in the middle of a, a civil war in England, and at that stage it was pretty chaotic. And he talked about the need to have an understanding where people gave authority to a ruler uh, and in turn the ruler established order and that was the social contract you give the authority to the ruler and in turn you get um, uh, uh, order and the avoidance of mayhem that was existing at that time Hobbes thought that the ruler should be a king and the king should live as long as he liked um, Locke didn't like that, he wrote about 30 years later and he said that there were, there were times where it, was o where it was okay, morally okay, to overthrow a king. Uh, and that was pretty important at that time because of the divine right of kings notion had been floating around all that century. He talked about life, liberty, health and property, and that was individual property, and the protection of individual rights. These are concepts that have become very, very powerful in a whole variety of ways, very influential in the French and American revolutions, in the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights, uh, the American Constitution and other charters. So terms like life, liberty, health and property, these are the things that a ruler, um, be it an elected ruler or a king or whatever, uh, is, is that's part of the social contract and the protection of those. The social contract got a little bit about a fashion until John Rawls came along um, uh, in the 1960s. He had, I think, been involved in the Vietnam War and didn't like the utilitarian justification for that. So he looked at the social contract and the whole notion of justice as fairness and he used a, a process that he, uh, he established the first principle of fair equality of opportunity and the second principle of differences only being justified when they benefit the least uh, advantaged people. Very influential at the time um, and the arguments still I think uh, stand up today. Milton Friedman, I've put in here a picture of him uh, under the social contract, but he's also uh, really known for his neoliberal economic philosophies. But philosophically and from a moral, ethical point of view, his writings are pretty naive and it's pretty easy to, to shoot down. The person who has, I think, done the most sophisticated version is Robert Nozick, who was a colleague of John Rawls. They both died earlier this century, and he argued for a night watchman state, the minimal role for government um, and the uh, maximum role for market type economies. Um, if you read his book, uh, he tries to justify the existence of a voluntary police force. And he fails, he admits it himself, he doesn't actually come out and, and justify it. And in the end, he, he um, fails in the conceptual and intellectual justification for a night watchman state. And for me, that's very important because he's the one, I think, who had the most sophisticated arguments for it. The social contract, Peter Brown. Um, Peter has written a book, he's a colleague of mine. Um, from Canada. Um, he's written a book which I think is a fairly good critique of the social contract uh, uh, tradition as interpreted by um, 
uh, modern writers. But Henry Hsu, who was a, a colleague also of Peter, is now at Oxford, has taken that social contract, contract tradition and argued in terms of rights to extend the notion of a human-human responsibility to a human-earth responsibility. So he talks about the purpose of a right being to protect humans against threats. Rights must be international and intergenerational, and we need a rights-protecting institution or series of institutions to be able to ensure that they are delivered. Climate change threatens the right to life, the right to health, the right to subsistence. These are the key phrases that come out of the social contract tradition. The principle of fairness justifies these rights and the protection from environmental destruction. So if you go down the Aristotelian tradition and the social contract tradition and the utilitarian tradition, what you find is that the modern writers, and I've listed them on the left, on the right hand side, have been using the framework of each of those traditions to extend the concern, the moral uh, domain from just focused on a human, human uh, framework to include a human earth dimension. And they're arguing that that extension is, is part of um, the necessity of dealing with the, the modern world. Adam Smith, I guess, is associated with the neoclassic tradition. This is um, Stream 6B. Uh, Ricardo, Jevons, uh, Menger and Walrus were writing in the 19th century, Perito a little bit later, Pigo and Coase, but they have all taken the notion of neoclassic economics, which places the emphasis on market mechanisms and pricing for determining the supply of goods and services. Uh, Beinhocker, in his, origin, his book, The Origin of Wealth, says that the two fundamental questions that the economists have faced is how wealth is created and how wealth is distributed. Smith, Walrus and Jevons focused on the second. Walrus, in 1874, conceptualised that through the law of equilibrium. The market provides a distribution through price. The aim is to balance supply and demand. And you've got the ball in the bowl, and the, bowl, the ball goes around and it wobbles around and eventually settles into, into balance and an equilibrium. And you find that if there is a, uh, an overpricing through competition, that will uh, bring about other opportunities to bring the price down, and eventually you'll get some sort of equilibrium. Fine, okay, thank you. Um, Solon um, talked about balanced growth, that he, he observed that in fact that earlier model was too static and that growth comes through population and technology. But the aim is still to balance supply and demand. So you have the, uh, the, the image of a high wire walker who is walking along the wire, so the economy can, can grow or contract, but it's still, you still need a rod to be able to keep it in balance. And so Solon was talking about um, a more sophisticated uh, approach that the, the ball in the, in the bowl is too simplistic. If we go to the science at the time, Carno, Clausius and Thompson, Lord Kelvin, were among the prominent scientists who developed the thermodynamic laws. The first law of thermodynamics states that all matter and energy in the universe is constant, that it cannot be created or destroyed. The second law, the entropy law, states that matter and energy can only be changed in one direction, from usable to unusable, from ordered to disordered. So the Earth is a closed system, except for the entry of energy in the form of sunlight. In Earth's system, what goes into a part of the system, a factory, must come out, and it does, with, it does so with its productive potential irrevocably diminished. Now, the entropy law is in quite contrast and, and 
um, contrast with the equilibrium law. The scientists, uh, sorry, the economists uh, believed in the existence of natural laws of economics that were analogous to the laws of physics. They substituted economic variables for physical variables. The physics they used, however, was soon to be outmoded by copying the equations of mid-19th century physics, they fell victim to the assumptions of the time. Unlike physicists, the economists held tenaciously to their now unfounded theories, and these long outmoded ideas still remain central in neoclassic economics. Starting from unscientific assumptions, but using a formidable array of mathematical tools, they have created a vast assembly of theories that really have no real basis in fact. By promising outcomes such as continuous growth and infinite substitutability of scarce resources, economists then gain power, positions of considerable power in government and commerce. This is a completely at odds with the idea of a resilient and sustainable relationship between humanity and nature. And you can read that, more about that in, from the quote that was taken from Sustainable Aotearoa New Zealand at, that's available at www.phase2.org. John Reed was the CEO of Citicorp in the um, uh, 1980s in North America. He got very disillusioned with the predictions that economists use because he found that they were often inaccurate. And he uh, funded uh, a 10 day cross disciplinary workshop in 1987, amongst a num number of other initiatives. And he brought the major scientists in North America and elsewhere and economists together to talk and uh, explain to each other what they were doing. The scientists were amazed at the economic assumptions. They talked about the throwback to the era of Walrus and Jevons. They said it was like visiting Cuba completely shut off from the Western world and the vintage cars of the 1950s. That they were using their, there was an intellectual embargo with an ingenuous stretching to try and fit. The physicist, physicist said, you guys, you really believe in this? The economist, yeah, but this allows us to solve these problems. If you don't make these assumptions, then you can't do anything. Physicist, yeah. But where does that get you? You're solving the wrong problem if that's not reality. The limits to growth uh, that came out in the 1970s um, really picked up on the, this major, one of the major assumptions of the neoclassic economic model and showed in fact that if, uh, if you continued the way where you could look at just unfettered growth and unlimitless substitutability, then the world was going to be in, in some real problems. For a variety of reasons, um, the limits to growth got sidelined. Um, but it's worth reading the article by Graham Turner, and I've got the reference there. He's an Australian. Um, and he's gone through back to the, the limits to growth and the predictions and said 30 to 40 years further down the track, have their predictions, how, how do their predictions pan out? And by and large, the original predictions have got uh, a lot of substance to that. So a number of the predictions have, uh, have in fact proved to be accurate. At the bottom of the wiring diagram is ecological economics. Now there are people like John Mill who have talked about the need to at some stage limit um, uh, growth and advancement, but I think it's Frederick Soddy uh, who really started what is now called ecological economics. Soddy was a chemist. He won the Nobel Prize for Chemistry in the 1920s, uh, but he was a chemist who believed that his chemistry and his science should benefit humankind and he was really very upset and disappointed about the way chemistry was used to make mustard gas, uh, mustard gas and various other bombs and, and armaments during the First World War. And in f trying to find out why this was the case, he 
did a, a number of analyses and came to the conclusion it was the way in which the economy was run. And he therefore started to write at some length about the need to develop an economics that was actually based on the thermodynamic laws. And he put in, in uh, put at least five major recommendations that uh, needed to be put in place to move the economy into a framework of ecological economics. Well, he was poo-pooed at the time. I mean, what do chemists know about economics? Um, so he was basically ignored. However, there was a very interesting article in the New York Times about five years ago. They went back and, and looked at those five fundamental recommendations. Four of them are now standard practice and accepted within the econo economic and business community. The fifth one, fractional banking, has still got to make the grade. However, um, Soddy's work was picked up by a number of people, including Balding and Daly. Kenneth Balding wrote a really important essay, The Economics of Coming Spaceship Earth, in 1966, very influential in the time. He talked about a cowboy economy and a spaceman economy. A cowboy economy being symbolic of the illimitable planes and also associated with reckless, exploitative, romantic and violent behaviour, which is characteristic of open societies. If you cut down all the forests in, a, in the valley and you pollute the water, what do you do? You get on your horse and you ride over the range to the next valley and you just keep going. Balding talked about a spaceman econo economy without unlimited reservoirs of anything, either for extraction or pollution. That man must find his place in a cyclic ecological system which is capable of continuous reproduction of material form, but it cannot escape having inputs of energy. Herman Daly talked about the output rule and the input rule. Look, the output rule, wastes should be kept within the assimilative capacity of the local environment. The input rule, harvest rates of renewable inputs shall not exceed the regenerative capacity of the natural system that generates them. So if you've got a forest, don't cut it all down at once, just cut down enough that you can replant and keep the forest ongoing. Renewable depletion rates, that's particularly oil and gas, uh, the rate at, you, you determine the use of that at the rate at which renewable substitutes are developed by human intervention, uh, invention and investment. So those are the rules put forward by Herman Daly and the natural step has very similar criteria. Peter Victor is a Canadian, he's written a book, Managing Without Growth, where he talks about the ways in which Canada can move to a sustainable economy. David Corton is an American who's done a lot of uh, work in terms of similar thinking. And there are others in the, uh, in the wiring di diagram. Costanza, who's now at ANU in Canberra, has done some really useful work, and there are others as well. I want to just go back to the ethical component of the neo of neoclassic economics and you'll see in the wiring diagram that I've actually got a, um, a dotted line that takes, it, takes that up to what I, what's called economic utilitarianism. It's one of the, utilitarianism is one of the two ethical theories on which neoclassic economics is based. The second is the social contract theory, particularly the, own to ri the right to own property and the right to own property as an individual. But um, it, was the sci it was the scientist, Leopold was a forester, uh, that amongst others was starting to recognise that traditional ethics basically dealt with human-human relationships and not human-earth relationships. Nature should not be for the sole utility of humans, should not have instrumental value for human benefit, but have its own intrinsic value. Leopold talks about a thing as right when it tends to preserve the integrity, stability and beauty of the biotic community. However, the concern for the environment didn't just come into bloom in the middle of last century when Leopold and others were around. It's been there a long time and many indigenous cultures are good examples of that. Francis of Assisi, 
William Blake, William Wordsworth, John Muir from the Sierra Club of North America. The whole notion of the promotion of wilderness, Gandhi, Rousseau, the German foresters, particularly about two centuries ago, and Schweitzer and Carson are some of the people who have uh, really been um, historically been important figures in pushing forward this concern. Schweitzer said, the great fault of ethics hitherto is they deal only with the relations of man to man. A man is ethical only when all life is sacred to him, that of plants and animals as well as his fellow man. We need a universal ethic of feeling responsible in an ever-widening sphere for all that lives, the ethic of reverence for life. Rachel Carson's has been identified by many, many people as the, the founder of the modern environmental movement with her book Silent Spring, where she postulated an urban environment that had no birds because they were killed and the, the uh, environment in which they needed to live was uh, destroyed by over chemical uh, artificial use. And uh, Hardin, in the tragedy of the commons, really talked about the pressure that goes on the commons and the, some of the consequences of that. The commons is a very important concept and Eleanor Ostrom, I was very pleased to see, got the Nobel Prize in Economics in 2009 for the study of what's called common pool resources. I think that one of the um, uh, mistakes that the social contract um, pioneers like Hobbes and Locke and others have dealt with uh, is that they have talked about property in an individual sense. They have not recognised the commons and the common way of owning property um, through things like cooperatives and indigenous peoples work of doing that. And Ostrom is one of the people, um, she died just uh, recently, uh, who has been done a lot of work in promoting that whole awareness. She emphasises how inter humans interact with ecosystems to maintain long-term sustainable resource yields. Common pool resources include many forests, fisheries, oil fields, grazing lands and irrigation systems. And one example I can think of is in Bali where they have used not the market forces but uh, they have used the local priests to be able to allocate the water to the various farmers and the way in which the river system benefits. So there are other mechanisms apart from just market forces that enable the allocation of resources and its use. Integrity, Laura Westra is an advocate for that where the various components and subsystems are in a healthy relationship and functioning properly. Uh, Paul Taylor wrote a quite important book at the time, uh, it was about 30 or 40 years ago, Respect for Nature, and more recently Dale Jamison has uh, picked up on that notion. I haven't talked very much about the religious traditions, but um, I think it's worth noting the notion of stewardship, uh, and in particular, this is well stated by the Methodist Church, where they say that this notion of stewardship is one of the core concepts. The theology of creation proclaims the consistent message of Christian stewardship, of humanity's obligation to care for the whole of the earth and its creatures. While historically some groups may have emphasised human dominion over creation, modern church teaching explicitly denies this interpretation. And the Methodist Church um, have done a lot of work in the, re, re, the interpretation of the Genesis story to say that the way of in justifying or um, authorising human domination over nature is actually contrary to that whole message of uh, the creation stories. So here are some of the concepts that we can choose from. Respect for nature, care, integrity, intrinsic value. Resilience, stewardship, wholeness, reverence for life. Which one are you going to choose? Well, how do you go about choosing? At the bottom uh, category of this slide, I've got ordinary language. We use words like right or wrong, bad, good, obligation, duty, responsibility. 
a parent's responsibility for their child. So these are terms that we use in everyday discourse uh, and in, in our behaviour towards others and the environment. So that's the notion of ordinary language. In the middle category, I've called it schema, um, and in that I've identified codes, constitutions, charters, creeds, policies. So in this university, um, how should the university as an employer um, act towards its staff and its employees and what responsibilities do employees have towards an employer? Well, that's uh, picked up and written in rules, a set of rules of codes, uh, policies, to be able to ensure that when we use terms like right or wrong or duty or responsibility, they are coherent and consistent within each other. In the top category, which is I've called meta-language, um, what the traditional philosophers and others are doing are choosing certain concepts, uh, core concepts, that they then use to say are primary and that they can be used to, to explain and describe schema and how we use language. And so you've got a set of characteristics under the Aristotelian tradition. You've got a single principle, utility, under the util utilitarian. And the social contract talks about rights, a set of rights. So how do you choose whether which meta-language or concept you're going to use? Well, you're really looking at how rich it is and how comprehensive that, that term is to be able to explain the way we use language. In a sense, the philosophers, the Aristotelians, utilitarians, are like scientists putting forward a hypothesis. They're saying, if you choose this term, human, uh, the, the notion of rights, then it will be able to give you a good explanation of your obligations as a, as a parent, etc., etc. Um, and uh, if it's comprehensive enough, then um, it's rich enough, then you can understand how to write schemas and how to understand that. If it's not comprehensive or it's somehow inadequate or not rich enough, then like a scientific hypothesis, you can say it's not good enough. Here are some of the charters and principles that um, um, are the codes that have been proposed, the World Charter for Nature. I've just picked out some key highlights of them. Nature shall be respected. The Rio Declaration, human beings are at the centre of concerns for sustainable development. The UN Global Compact uh, talks about ten principles, and three of those deal with the environment. They, they include the precautionary approach, promoting greater environmental responsibility, and encouraging environmental friendly technologies. So one way of looking at this is to say, are those principles under the United Nations Global Compact strong enough and rich enough to be able to deal with the issues of climate change and the other things that we, that we are facing in this world? And if they're not, then um, you can reject those principles on those grounds. The United Nations Principles of Responsible Investment um, basically promote uh, an ESG, Environmental, Social and Corporate Governance. I will talk about this in more detail in the next presentation, but I would be uh, claiming that in fact the UNPRI is, is very inadequate to be able to deal with responsible investment, investment that actually cares for the planet and people. If you look at the Earth Charter, it talks about respect for Earth and life and all its diversity, and it talks about the care of the community of life with understanding, compassion and love. So the, these are some of the charters using some of the principles that um, have uh, varying degrees of adequacy. So the, the, the diagram at the top left is talking about energy coming in and the process of photosynthesis <coughs> capturing that uh, in various forms for our use. Tansley in 1935, he was an English biologist, talked about the coin of the realm 
is in the economy of nature is not a material like minted gold or silver or paper money, but solar energy. And uh, Vitusek in 1986 uh, looked at the way in which that energy is being used and estimated about 40% of it, a little over 40%, was devoted to human activity. And he was arguing that current economic activities monopolise this unjustly to the detriment of current and future generations and to the earth of the, as a whole. The top right is a picture of the ecological footprint um, and it's showing that in about 2010 the way in which the footprint is calculated is that humans are using one and a half times the capacity beyond which the earth can deal with that and that uh, if we keep going at that rate then we really are in, in dire trouble. So a sustainable economy develops budgets for human activity based on these principles, these scientific and ethical principles. Where do you start? If we start with the notion that nature is mainly to be seen for instrumental utility for humankind, but subject to certain limits, it's much harder to develop a relationship with nature that enables a fit that works for humans and where nature is able to provide a sustainable place for human life. It's the same as having a competitive ethic for business but within some limits. If the basic value of business is maximisation of self-interest, it's very difficult for a business executive to leave the office for home and change into a loving, caring spouse or parent. And to develop a society as a whole that is loving and a caring place to live in, while a significant portion of it works to contrary standards, is very difficult. People do not find it easy to be schizophrenic. Aristotle talked about phrenesis or practical wisdom. That is a complex learned and nuanced ability to be virtuous. It's like an apprenticeship and it's not something that can be switched on and off easily. If humans value nature intrinsically but recognise that it is also of utility for food, shelter and warmth, it will be much easier to design an economy and society that has the right relationship with nature than if we start with the belief that the world is primary for our use but within certain limits. Rather than start at one end, the world is for us to exploit and then impose some limits, start at the other end. We should ensure nature's health and resilience are paramount and then see what resources are needed for humans and how they can be used. Some implications. In an overpopulated planet using the resource use principles of neoclassic economics, there is a future where a significant proportion of humans will die and many will live in miserable circumstances. The option of a gradual and orderly transition to a world where humans live in harmony with the rest of nature has gone. Humanity is facing that transformation from an economy that destroys the earth and that transformation will come whether humanity chooses to plan for it or not. While we should support investments that move humankind towards a sustainable economy, we need to change the way we live, work and play based on different investments, production, reward and decision making systems. The way we build our houses, move about, grow our food, clothe ourselves and live and work in cities will fundamentally change. The dominant global economic system is not based on modern science. It is not based on an ethic that deals with human earth relationships except in instrumental and, and anthropocentric terms. We need to develop an ethic of respect or care or reverence for life, whatever, whatever term that you prefer that you think has the richness and the complexity and the comprehensiveness to be able to identify the kinds of behaviours uh, that we need to be able to survive in our world. We need to recognise that in the economy of nature the currency is solar energy 
and we need to live within that capacity of the earth to support life and human life. A sustainable economy develops budgets for human activity and investment based on these scientific and ethical principles. So, I've come to the end of the first presentation. Uh, it's called The Foundations, an Economy for a Resilient World, Foundations. And in two weeks' time, I'll talk about an economy for a resilient world, some policy implications, with particular reference to our financial and banking systems and uh, whether our investments, um, ha how good they are and, how, and what we should be doing or could be doing to be able to bring those in line with the principles, the foundations that I've talked about tonight. So, time for questions. Thank you, I really enjoyed that. And this might be um, uh, what we're going to talk about in two weeks' time. But I'd be interested in your thoughts on to what extent the classical economic model can be rescued uh, by um, plugging gaps. I'm thinking particularly of um, inputs that are not recognised, that are invisible. But uh, if included, if priced in some way, um, might, according to the neoclassical theorists, uh, bring about the kinds of behaviours that are indeed required to protect the resilient world. Okay, if you go to the wiring diagram and go along the neoclassic line, you come to environmental economics. And environmental economics is really putting a price on the environment, and it's starting to, to say, um, you know, if we, if we follow that practice, then the economic consequences are such and such. So uh, cap and trade is an attempt to try and price um, the use of fossil fu fuels, and it's based on um, the work by Coase. If you, he was one of the people in that, in that diagram of the, uh, the ancient worthies, if you like. What Coase did was take um, the ozone issue and priced the uh, CFCs and used the market mechanisms to be able to price it out of existence. And that's the cap and trade philosophy. And in theory, it's, it's not too bad. In practice, the Europeans have got it wrong. Um, our cap and trade system is a farce because there are just too many people who have got exemptions. Um, and so, uh, as a transition, you use that, that mechanism, and that's one way. But don't think that it's actually going to solve the basic problems. Uh, um, it's so, um, yes, um, when you're in a position where you can see a pretty terrible situation down, down the track, you grasp at any initiatives that may be able to help you take the next step. And environmental economics is one of them. Uh, that's where I put Stern. Um, I mean, his, he's basically an environmental econ economist, and he's trying to, he's arguing that uh, if you put a price on, on climate, then it's not too expensive to be able to make the changes. Um, but uh, unfortunately, um, he is still not being heard. Uh, and my feeling is that what my, my personal feeling is that things most probably have to fall apart before we actually start to make the real fundamental changes. The business as usual model is still paramount and from somebody who's returned from Australia, uh, I'm quite glad that I'm not there to listen to all Abbott's stuff. <laughs> is that okay? Yeah. Mm. Instead of actually making the problem worse by becoming unstable. 
Um, well, there are going to be some things that I'll talk about next time um, in more specific details. But I think that uh, I think that what I've been trying to do tonight is to say that piecemeal initiatives really um, uh, are not adequate. Okay, you you can accept them, but they need to be within the context of a recognition of four much more fundamental changes. Um, and so, if you if you start to put the ecological footprint in place and start, instead of having the, econo e the, the so-called economic indicators on the, on the national news, how about having a solar energy indicator um, and, and starting to measure that and as a result of that you then say, okay, uh, in terms of, the, of bringing back the, the, the ecological footprint into some sort of um, uh, better state, what are the sorts of things we need to do? You know, how we need to look at our water and uh, look at our energy use and, and the various policies that follow from that. I'm, uh, I don't like the term bring it back into balance um, because there are times where I think that takes us down the wrong kind of track. I, I'm not a, a utilitarian. I think that, um, but I will say that uh, there is a place for cost-benefit analyses, um, but within a framework where the ethical principles have already been established. The problem with a lot of the um, the classic, the neoclassic economists is that. They, f they put a price on things and then decide, in the light of the fact that stuff is cheaper, that's the right course of action to go to. Um, so, um, just trying to think of his name, that um, Larry Summers, when he was at the World Bank, said, OK, it's, uh, it's much cheaper to be able to deal with toxic substances in developing countries because the cost of it is much cheaper. Therefore, in the developed world, what we should do is ship all our toxic stuff to the de developed country because it's cheaper to deal with there. Okay? Now, that's where price is determining your ethical principles. What I would say is determine your ethical principles and then you look at a variety of options and pricing is one of the ways in which you can then start to identify options within that framework. So there are market forces um, that I would be wanting to, if I was a, 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 policy, a, a politician in a charge of uh, developing the economic activities, budgets, etc., etc., there are some things that market forces that I would use, but it would be within a framework where we have already determined uh, what is right and what is wrong, and we don't use price to do, to do that. Yeah. And that's almost exactly the example I, I thought of in relation to coupling of commodity or pollution pricing and variability of exchange rates. It's exactly the sort of complex outcome that you result. Right. Yeah, Robert, I was pleased to see you brought the in ethic of care as one of the possible alternatives. And so I just wondered if within that you looked at the work of any of the feminist economists. Um, I can't say that I'm, I'm not an economist, so I can't say that I'm familiar with all the details of the feminist economic stuff that you most probably are referring to. Um, I am aware, I've, I've done some of the reading in terms of the ecological philosophers who are women and the f feminist approaches to that. Um, and, um, you know, that's good stuff. Okay. I haven't been able to identify it, but I would, I would want to, um, I want to come back and say I think that uh, there are a number of people, writers, who are not on this wiring diagram. And then, but what I've tried to do is choose the ones who I think have been most influential in directing human development, and unfortunately the majority of those are men. It's not that I like that, it's just the way it, in which it's, it's worked. 
Um, so uh, this is a f this is biased towards men, but I would want to argue that if if you're looking at the forces and the pressures and the characteristics, the determinants of the kind of world we have at the moment, then it it is related to these ethical principles, to the kind of e economic um, frameworks that we have and the understanding of the science. And what I've tried to do is to, is to link them in a way that identifies a much greater appreciation of how they, um, to get away from the silo stuff. Um, Well, I would hope that you would go away from this presentation saying that we actually have to, to get outside of that. If you haven't got that message from me, then I've failed. Yes, no, no, I, I can see that, that you totally have, but I think there's still more. There's, there's even more that could come into it. And I appreciate that you can't do it all, but maybe the fact that we just constantly talk about an economy instead of a society is one of the biggest um, what I've tried to do is to reclaim the word, the word economy, okay? because I think we fall into the trap of allowing current politicians, the Abbots and so forth, um, to say this is the economic, this is the economy. You know, we're concerned for a balanced budget. I mean, it's no more balanced really than <laughs> anyhow. Uh, what I want to say is that, is that that is based on a very outdated and inadequate understanding of what an economy should be like. And therefore, if you, talk, if you just talk about a society without actually talking about the need to rethink the whole notion of what an economy is, then to some extent you're giving the ground to the neoclassic economics because they just then say, well, you know, you're... Um, you're not wise about, you're not an economist and therefore it's irrelevant. Of course, if you start talking about proper e economics, you have to start talking about what kind of society you want. They're all interrelated. Um, I accept that. But um, I think it's really important for people as part of the public discourse in these things to reclaim the, the, the concept of an economy and say, at the moment, we are being dished up with uh, Mickey Mouse stuff and that we really need to um, talk economic sense. I think it's critical, Robert, that you made the point when you were asking the gentleman's question that if we don't, if we don't make some decisions soon, the ecology is going to, is going to make some for us. Uh, and in a similar way, I think the apoplexy with which people have responded to Thomas Piketty as an economist is that in, and to the criticism that comes from, from a world that's not got a feminist point of view in it, uh, is one which says if you, if you continue to, to centralise wealth to not just the 1% but the 0.1%, uh, and if you continue to have uh, male power so, so prevalent over, over uh, the interests of women, you are going to actually cause a social effect. Uh, and the effect of that will be something which, which crosses into the economy and into how we manage our ecology. Our social ecology is as much as our environmental ecology. And I think that's partly where 
where the alternative narrative that we've been trying to run within the Fabian group has been trying to push some capacity for that. In fact, it was only when I um, started talking to Robert that I remembered just how, how graphic, literally, the graph was that Rick Bowden put up years, about a year ago in the Monetary Class of those sessions, where he, he made that point where, where we just went down a route, we started down a route where the consumption of energy was now so high that it was destroying the capacity for us to have uh, a productive economy in a, in a, in a long-term sustainable future. And he put that—he put a date on that. Robert, I think it's really interesting to hear what you're saying, but I think we need to know a little bit more about you. <laughs> tell us, tell us where you come from. Um. Okay, well, I did philosophy way back. <laughs> and I must say that the ethics that I've got here is nothing what I was taught. I was taught what, what ethics I was taught dealt with the traditional stuff. Um, uh, I did a, um, I did a, um, oh, soon I, when, I, when I left university at, at Wellington, um, I, I got a job in the Wellington Hospital Board. Um, and that led me to do a postgraduate diploma in health administration and then a PhD. Uh, the PhD was measuring the health status of the community for planning purposes. Um, it's never been used as far as I know, the index, but um, it, um, it introduced me to the whole notion of validity and uh, that notion of validity and how you ensure that the measures that you have measure what you want to measure and need to measure is uh, really pertinent when it comes to the socially responsible indicators because the majority of those are invalid. Uh, at the end of the PhD there was no immediate niche in the health service for me so I actually uh, became city manager at Napier City Council brought in by a reforming mayor. Um, we did a whole series of things that eventually became the standard for the reforms under Bassett and Elwood. Uh, in the 90s, um, I, through my wife and others, um, uh, Gail had started a language school for overseas students in Napier, and so I started an agricultural college, piggybacking in on that, uh, and then started to look at the local government reforms and linked up with some colleagues at Massey and ran some, a conference and did some work on uh, the reforms five years down the track and had they actually achieved um, and wrote a number of pu publications which I think were quite influential at the time. Um, as a result, uh, the next step was really to come to Auckland and um, do some teaching and consulting and pick up on some of the governance issues because I'd done one of my major research work was uh, to do uh, uh, to look at the governance reforms um, and that led me to uh, I was trying to get a, a consulting job with the Anglican Church <laughs> and that led me to think well what a, uh, um, uh, uh, the Anglican Church had a load of of money at that stage and that took me to say well are they investing that money in the right kind of way and that then led me to say um, uh, if I'm looking at investment what are the environmental indicators that I should be looking for <laughs> in order to identify whether that money's well invested um, and then that that led me to two major jobs. One was the Quaker Institute for the Future, because my wife had been, uh, was a Quaker and eventually I became a Quaker. And there was a think tank in North America that, that looked at um, building a, um, uh, building uh, an economy based on right relationships. And the second major project that I looked at was uh, joined was the Sustainable Aotearoa New Zealand and their publications and those those were really major influential uh, periods for me where I had to uh, 
rethink the ethics. And this, the wiring diagram that you've got is really, it's really being produced over the last um, five plus years because I was getting economists talking to me about alternative economies and I was looking at some of the ethics and the science and I didn't quite know how it all fitted together so I had to, I had to start writing it down and, and doing the dotted lines and so this, this current version has gone through, it, it's basically stayed the same uh, but it's, it's had a large number of details changed as I've worked through the issues. Um, and it then took me um, to, I was involved at the beginning of this um, about 10, uh, 10 or 12 years ago in starting the Council for Social Responsible Investment and then that led me to really do a critical look at investment. And next time you'll see some of the work, the results of that, where I've looked at the investment of banks and uh, sovereign wealth funds and managed funds. Um, when I was in Australia, one of the things I did was to uh, um, start the, the Australasian Centre for Corporate Responsibility, which was uh, providing a, an umbrella for investors to come together and use their funds in a considered kind of way. It was based on the ICCR, the Interfaith Centre for Corporate Responsibility in New York, which is a grouping of Jewish, Protestant and Catholic funds, about a hundred billion. And if you want to see the best shareholder activism in the world, you go to the ICCR. Um, Interfaith Centre for Corporate Responsibility. In Australasia there is nothing really and that's why we started the Australasian Centre for Corporate Responsibility to provide investors with a way of engaging with companies at AGMs and so on. Thanks. So, a bit long-winded, sorry. No, that's fine. Can I thank you all for your attendance? Um, I've, I'm very keen for us to come back for Robert's second session. Um, I also just wanted to go through the, the process of letting you know that we've, we've the, the, the next one after Robert's session that we've got in mind is, is uh, Max Rashbrook um, developing more on his material around inequality uh, and picking up from the arguments that have come through from uh, the, the recent sort of um, rock star status of Thomas Piketty. Uh, and looking at the issue not of income inequality but of wealth inequality in an economy such as our own uh, and that's what Max uh, will be talking about when he updates his work um, and his best-selling book which will also be available um, for sale at that, at that, on, that, on that occasion. I don't know if you've noticed it but just this uh, last week <coughs> there was a very interesting live broadcast uh, from Boston of a discussion between Thomas Piketty and Elizabeth Warren, um, sponsored by an organised, or oh, the Huffington Post, uh, I think, were actually the distributors of the of the broadcast. But it was sponsored by the Move On organisation and an organisation which I think might somewhere come into Robert's um, group of ethical, responsible people, uh, an organisation called Millionaires for Prosperity. Uh, which subtitles itself Millionaires Who Want, who want Tax Increases. Uh, and they are a group who, who put up the money to, uh, to create a climate discussion around what, would you, what should we do to generate a better uh, economy and a more equal society. Bearing in mind that this uh, university has just had a sell out uh, series of lectures from Wilkinson and Pickett. Uh, on, the, on the spirit level uh, and that we're, we're contemplating uh, an ongoing discussion about the size and, and nature of our economy vis-a-vis -vis child poverty and poverty in general. So thank you all for coming. Uh, I hope you can find reasons for us to come to, uh, to, come to subsequent events and I'll do my darndest to see if we can run a program through from the beginning of July through, in, through that silly season which is going to be called the election. Uh, far be it from me to say that we've got the power to influence anybody's vote, but I sure hope we've got the power to influence the narrative. So thank you all for coming.
Oh, fake rubber. I should have said fake rubber. <laughs>